Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you today and thank you for the invitation um, to speak. Um, my name is Karen Boyce, I've just pulled my um, belt off, which I need to hold up my um, speaker. My name is Karen Boyce and I work in Ulster University. Um, I was interested yesterday to hear that Anna and a few others had worked in the field for over 20 years. I've been working um, in the University of Ulster for 31 years. Um, so what I am going to do today, I hope within the next 15 minutes, is sort of condense some of the views that I've had in that time working um, in the area of evacuation and human behaviour and particularly some of the work that I've done with people with disabilities is try to um, express some of the, um, the views that I have gathered and some of the experiences that I've had when, as I researched people leaving buildings during evacuations, um, real fires that have occurred um, and, and other work that we've done in this area. So the title of my presentation, Changing Demographics Implications for Design and Management, um, really comes from a point and a context of a changing demographics in society. Um, Ragnar um, talked about people at risk. Um, our statistics will show us at the minute that are about 20 to 24 percent of the world's population have a disability and um, 8 to 12 percent of those with a mobility impairment which I guess when we talk about um, evacuation from buildings is only one of the many impairments that might limit your ability to evacuate but uh, for me it's the most um, the most critical one in the sense that, that we still have a lot of issues I, th I feel to deal with. Um, we're an ageing society and we know that the prevalence of disability increases with age and the types of impairments in fact um, change as we age as well with mobility becoming more prevalent and we are also a more obese society. Um, uh, we have a graph there, I'll not go into detail, but across the world if we don't intervene people are becoming more obese and that also has implications for um, uh, for society, not least because um, the prevalence of disability is higher among obese, it's, it's about double that of, of the, the general population. Um, so that's the context that we're working in and I want to take us back right back to 1976, um, maybe before some of you were born, um, but this was a statement that was made by a gentleman called Selwyn Goldsmith, you might not be familiar with him, but he was a real advocate for human rights for people with disabilities in the 1970s, a lobbyist of parliament for access to buildings. He, um, he wrote a very seminal book called Designing for the Disabled and in that book in 1976 um, he made this statement which is not very politically correct today but it was a statement he made all that time ago and it said buildings always have been and always will be geared to suit two-legged able-bodied people and not people propped on sticks or rolling about in chairs on wheels. Um, not very politically correct but I, I guess you get the sense of his frustration at that time as to where we were with regards to our design and so um, what I really want to look at is you know two questions is the design of our buildings appropriate for the populations of today and into the future and is it realistically to to assume that those populations can be safely managed. So I just want to bring up some issues as I see them, um, flick through them, um, and then maybe we can have a little discussion later um, or, or as the day goes on about more prevalent issues. Um, I'm not familiar with the guidance um, exactly in Sweden or in across the world. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with some, um, but certainly when we look at the UK, what I can say is that our guidance with respect to how we design means of escape in buildings was developed at some point um, by a committee and are infrequently updated. I guess that's the situation in, in most countries. Um, we certainly in the UK have very questionable underpinning assumptions. Um, the main one and the main one of concern that's there being that um, in terms of our five millimetres per, ex per person exit width, which is how we design our means of escape provision, that we assume that they can move at a rate of 80 people per metre per minute through a door or downstairs. That is a very optimum flow that, ar that arose from studies of able-bodied people many, many years ago. Um, and we also assume a holding capacity of two to three people per meter squared and just a little um, uh, slide on the right there shows you that that's not always the case. So we already are from a starting point of very questionable assumptions in some of our guidance um, and, and I guess that's where some of the difficulties that I see with mixed ability populations um, that I like to call them rather than thinking about disabled and able-bodied um, of, of where we go with that. So what are the issues? 
Um, first issue, very obvious one, reduced walking speeds. Um, if we look at our design um, guide, um, that's PD7974 in the UK, our fire engineering design guide, um, it suggested um, speeds of 0.6 to 1.1 metres per second on stairs. Now, actually, this is just um, uh, just this year, a few months ago, been updated to actually include lower speeds with for people with disabilities. But as you can see in the in the table there, which includes some of my work, my PhD work, and other work by Fujiyama and Tyler, and Erica Kulagowski at NIST, that those speeds that were that are in our design guides for fire engineers um, are often um, very much over predicting the speeds that are capable by many people in our in our society and people who are accessing and using buildings. Um, the other thing about those speeds is um, that they were all um, collected over relatively short distances. Erica's Eric Kulagowski's work was over 13 stories. And what she saw was that people's speed reduced significantly over those 13 stories for older people moving, you know, when we were looking at unimpeded speeds. Um, but the other work was only, my work, for example, was only one over one stair, one flight of stairs. Um, so, you know, when we start to think about moving over longer distances, then fatigue um, becomes an issue or maybe an issue. It may be the fact that as we're in a evacuating population, that the stop start, natural stop start of the flow gives people with disabilities that time to rest. But certainly we know very little about the performance of people with mobility impairments over long distances. Um, I know that Matthias has done some work ascending on stairs, um, but a lot of the work, and I guess for ethical reasons, maybe doesn't include the people that we really need the, the information on, the people who really have the difficulties in, in moving. We know that slower people will need to stop to rest. Um, I find that in my work, and when we study some of the evacuations in WTC, on 9-11 um, and Erica as I've already said did show that the speed was likely to reduce over longer distances so not only are people moving more slowly but they will need to stop to rest the diagram on the right there just shows if I can use my little oh sorry my little pointer which I don't seem to be working properly that's it not this screen that's not what you see <laughs> you see up here uh, I'll get there and um, this is just um, a graph that was adapted from a study by IS um, reported at Spearpoint so which asked people how long they could um, walk without stopping and then related to that to their measured walking time and you can see that as the walking speed is lower then the time that they can walk before stopping is, is also lower so th this is an issue um, and the implications of that are that they change evacuation dynamics and can, can change evacuation dynamics very considerably. Um, so no longer may we be thinking about this 80 people per minute, meter per minute in the stairs. Um, this um, is a quotation out of um, NIST's study of the evacuation on 9-11 um, where they reported that 51% of people they interviewed said that slower people moving on stairs were a constraint to their evacuation. So we're not just talking about the slower moving individuals here, we're talking about the whole people moving down the stairs. Now granted those stairs in 9-11 were not designed for full evacuation, but there's still many stairs of, of those similar widths that might be in buildings today that people are moving down. And these are some of the, um, the uh, just little quotes from people and the experiences that they had. We took up the entire width of the stairway and no one could get around us until we came to a landing. That was a gentleman assisting an overweight occupant, a person who was obese down the stairs. If I just skip to the last one there, we took up the whole stairway going at a staccato pace. She would cuddle up to me and let people by. This is Susan, who one of the girls that we interviewed, um, uh, who was in the World Trade in World Trade Center one on the twentieth floor, um, talking about um, her sister who had to, to move in to let other people pass. And, and that's, I guess, one of um, some of the, the other issue that we have is that people not only move more slowly, but they also take up more space. People using a mobility aid does not take up the same space as a person who's not using a mobility aid, walking sticks, relators, um, walking frames, wheelchair users, of course. Um, Referring back to um, our movement towards um, being more obese, um, ellipses, body ellipses are changing. One study suggested that we could be um, taking space of up to 0.44 metres squared, which is much greater than what we imagine we used to, to, to take. And there's a narrowing of the gap between the hip and the shoulder. So when we're designing buildings, we assume we're going to swing above the handrail. But now if, there's a, if we're changing body shape, what does that do in terms of where we relocate ourselves relative to the handrail? Um, 
when we have people moving that are sl slower moving or need assistance in stairs, obviously there's increased group size. That changes the dynamics of evacuation. Um, the girl Susan that I just referred to a little moment ago um, had two assisters, one in front, one to the side and one behind that stayed with her during the whole evacuation. But she also referred to other people, about five or six people who'd come off the floor at the same time as her who weren't in her immediate physically assisting group that stayed with her because people have this tendency to stick together and that has been seen in other evacuations as well um, that, 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 that I've been aware of. Um, and of course when we get people needing assistance then we get counterflows as we did in 9-11 and as we've seen in many other evacuations. So all of a sudden these stairs that we designed with an assumption of a flow and a holding capacity of you know very optimum flow, a certain holding capacity has a very very different dynamic and depending on the width of those stairs and the people moving them and when the person with the disability or the slower moving people move into the stairs that completely changes the dynamics of evacuation. So the question really for me um, is, are our stairs sufficient to accommodate mixed ability evacuation today and will they be in the future and what are the implications if they're not? The other thing that I wanted um, to mention is the fact that, of course, in certainly in our guidance in the UK and I guess elsewhere across the world, we do consider people with disabilities and we do recognise that there are people who enter a building that can't use stairs. And we provide refuges, a temporarily safe space for people to wait before their onward assistance, either by assisted physically down um, stairs or um, using lifts. Um, our guidance certainly suggests the use that the use of lifts, but it's not by any means compulsory. And I guess that's the same I mean, other parts of the world. Um, but our guidance. Um, uh, suggests one refuge space for a wheelchair user um, 900 by 1400 millimetres to allow to manoeuvre in each protected stair at each level. That same guidance says that you can have two exits for up to 600 people and we assume in our exit width that one's discounted. So that means essentially that you could have one refuge space for 600 people and that isn't even reflective of the number of wheelchair users in our society today. It's nowhere near reflective of the number of wheelchair users or the percentage of wheelchair users in our, our society today. I believe in Sweden, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's one refuge space per 100 people um in in um our buildings um, I don't have time to go into this in detail, I can talk to anybody about it later, but um, this was a situation that we had um, in 1990 in a museum building in Belfast. Um, there was an Armada exhibition, um, a building that would normally have been used as art galleries now became an exhibition space with um, a flow um, going, coming here, this is the bottom right hand corner, coming right round here and here, round here and out here. There was an alarm set off by a toaster on the ground floor, they evacuated the building and there just happened at the time of the alarm to be a group of, of people with disabilities, four wheelchair users, five others with disability and three carers at the front of the flow. Essentially what happened is they moved into the stair, um, into the refuge space, the landing would essentially be the refuge space in a building, um, but of course the refuge space wasn't sufficient for them, there just wasn't room for them. One of them did um, go down in the lift, the others were eventually assisted by staff um, um, down the stairs, um, but for a considerable period of time there was a lot of anxiety reported um, by the people trying to leave the stairs. There was an estimate of 600 people on this floor trying to get off and because of the natural flows most of them are coming in this direction um, and a lot of anxiety in a building that would have taken normally three minutes to evacuate took somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes and that did not account for the third wheelchair user um, who actually abandoned his wheelchair having not been confident about the assistance that the staff were giving him and bumped his way down the stairs stairs and that is not the first time that has happened. There's other evidence that that is happening because of a lack of communication and confidence in the people that are trying to assist. So you can start to see how if we're not designing our spaces properly and we have a changing demographic, how that can significantly impact evacuation. This is just a little quick illustration of the impact of a refuge. You know, we designed for one wheelchair user. What happens if we have another wheelchair? And this is just a little graphic, actually, that Pete Thompson, um, who was speaking yesterday, created and simulates for me just to show the difference in time that it takes, you know, the impact that's going to have on the flow. 
But of course, we don't just design for wheelchair users. It's not just wheelchair users that need to use a refuge, as the Museum of Aggregation showed. Um, there's older people. If you're a, a person who's with a person in a wheelchair, you're not going to, in the event of a fire, just wheel them into the refuge and walk off, are you? You're not going to abandon them there in the refuge. So we, we need to be sizing our refuges differently for how they're going to be used. Um, on 9-11, there was a report, um, I think, by one of the, um, the fire officers that said that there was a floor, um, the, the, the actual floor is um, pretty not quite known, but they reckoned that um, the people that were on that floor, a rest floor, only comprised about 50% of people who had a mobility impairment. The other 50 were people who were there with them and assisting them and staying with them. So we need to think about how we're designing our refuges. And I guess my other question is, are those refuges sufficient? And I think from what I'm saying to you, I think you get where I'm going with this, <laughs> but I'll let you make up your own mind. The final issue um, really is management. Um, I could talk all day about this. Um, we had a study in um, the UK, the Department of Communities and Local Government, and they did a study looking at refuge areas and their management, and this was the conclusion. The management of evacuation procedures, including refuges and their alternatives, requires a major overhaul. And that was long after legislation in the UK that requires owners, occupiers, to do their risk assessments and have responsibility for managing their buildings. Um, on 9-11, the NIST study concluded that mobility and pair documents were not universally accounted for by existing evacuation procedures. The girl Susan that I mentioned earlier on um, had a disability. She actually wheeled herself around in a secretary's chair with wheels. Um, she, uses, she used a walking aid and she had no plan for her evacuation. Now she, she enacted a plan at the time but there was no forward planning for her evacuation. And what we see time and time again when we look at the evidence is a lack of training um, and that can lead to injury. This um, little um, photograph on the right hand side is a study that we did in a film theatre where um, the member of staff didn't communicate with the wheelchair. The, the, the gentleman using the wheelchair, he assumed he was going to catch him as he tipped his wheelchair user to, uh, wheelchair to go up the stairs and he fell out of his chair. So there are injuries, that there wasn't an injury in this case, but there are injuries that can occur. And, uh, and there is a real need for training in this. There are issues I know with manual handling and, and um, the difficulties for staff, but we need staff who are trained and who can communicate. The gentleman in the in the Ulster Museum who uh, abandoned his wheelchair. Um, I met that gentleman actually on another occasion, another work that I was doing. The staff that we'd interviewed initially said the man was very difficult. He wouldn't, he refused to be helped. The gentleman himself said, I had watched two of my friends being manhandled down the stairs by people who didn't know what they were doing. And for me, the safest option was to get out of my chair and bump my way down the stairs. So there's a real need to communicate, um, communicate during the procedures and communicate procedures to those who need to use them. Um, because there is a real lack of understanding of, among users of what a refuge is. This is a study I'll not go into it in detail now, but we found that 60% of people with disabilities who would need to use a refuge who couldn't use stairs didn't know what a refuge was. So if people, if we're designing buildings with systems and, and place, things in place to assist somebody and the users don't know what they are, then why and how are they going to use them? Um, physical escape, I, I've noticed my time and I will be very quick, um, assisted escape is very physically demanding, it takes up a lot of time, we can't assume that the assistive devices that we put in buildings are going to be used easily. Um, I refer to an evacuation of John Abruzzo who was in 9-11, you may have seen him, on. he's been on the media, um, he was assisted by 10 people taking him down the stairs. 10 people, not one person that you know some of the media would lead you to believe, 10 people taking it in turns to get him down the stairs and he got out five minutes before WTC um, one collapse, one hour 46 minutes from impact. Um, so this is considerable manpower, or requires considerable manpower and it is a real challenge, I'm not pr pretending it's not, but it's a challenge that we have to take on board. Lifts are the solution, I'm not going to go into that now, or a are part of the solution, or could be part of the solution. And it was interesting yesterday when Kathleen was talking about the, the fire safety ecosystem, about the, you know, the financial implications. And I guess, you know, ironically, many years ago, um, access to buildings wasn't given for people with disabilities because there was a perceived cost with that. We've moved on from that. Now there's a perceived cost with, with lifts, and maybe someday we'll move on from that as well. 
So just to um, finish, um, the challenge is for all of us. And, and again, I'll go back to Kathleen. Um, yesterday, I, I prepared these slides before and I heard you talk and nearly every one of my points here really it's into one of the, of the things that you talked about, Kathleen. Um, there are easily identifiable scenarios in my mind where safety could really be seriously compromised if we don't start to address the issue now and into the future. Um, in the Ulster Museum, if there had been a fire on the floor on that day, there would have been deaths. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever about it. And unfortunately, we're not going to, I hope we don't get to the stage where something like that happens until we start to take action. But it requires action from all of us, code developers, to think about whether our provision is sufficient enforcers to ensure that the guidance has been followed. In our guidance, we suggest um, communication in a refuge area. I know that that's not being followed. And with technology today, there's no reason why that can't be happening. Um, fire engineers to develop realistically realistic occupancy profiles and use the worst credible evacuation scenarios. We use the worst credible fire scenarios. Why are we not using the worst credible evacuation scenarios? Researchers, I'm one of them, to develop our understanding of mixed ability evacuation and be able to quantify for use by engineers. Modelers to be able to accommodate the complexity of evacuation when they're modeling. Management to do all the things that management are supposed to be doing, which is a real challenge. And also building users, people to engage, to be educated and to engage in the process because they have a responsibility as well. Um, I'm really sorry for going over time, I know I have, so I apologise and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>